and welcome to part three of my overview of Medicaid. Now, I didn't intend initially to make a three-part video on Medicaid, but it just proved to be so complicated that it was really best to split it up into segments as opposed to trying to get through all of it in one long video. At least I thought so. Now, in part one, one of the main points that I made was the distinction between Medicaid and Medicare, two programs that are often confused. In general, Medicaid is a government program designed to help impoverished people pay their medical expenses, whereas Medicare is a government program that is essentially health insurance for seniors. Now, I have a dedicated video on the question of whether Medicare helps to pay for long-term care costs, nursing homes, and the like of this. I'm not going to get into that here. I invite you to see that video for more detail. But although there are many things that could be said distinguishing Medicaid and Medicare, we could boil the distinction down in terms of eligibility to two things. The first is that Medicare, the health insurance program for seniors, has an age requirement. So you have to be 65 years old at least in order to qualify for Medicare. But Medicare does not have any financial requirements. So Basically, a person can have income of any level, assets of any amount, and they still have access to Medicare. Now, they might pay a little bit more for their premiums in some cases, but they still have access to the program, unlike Medicaid. With Medicaid, there is no age requirement. So essentially, people of various ages can have access to it, but there's very strict financial requirements that go along with that. Basically, a person has to have very low assets and very low income. Now, the asset situation was the main topic of part two, and I invite you to see that video for more detail. And there was plenty to talk about. So, for example, states can fall into 50% or 100% categories in terms of the calculations that they apply to try to figure out what a person or a couple's countable assets are. Additionally, Medicaid has strict requirements regarding transfer of assets, how you dispose of resources, and other things along the lines of this. And so in the asset video, I talk about what is referred to as the Medicaid look-back period. I talk about penalty periods that can be imposed, and I sort of give an overview of the asset situation. But abstracting away from the various niceties and complexities that are very important, we can say that essentially from the standpoint of assets, a person can be Medicaid eligible only if the amount of assets they have is $2,000 or less. But as viewers have no doubt noticed by now, the overall situation is extraordinarily complicated, and so you're invited to speak with an expert in the event that you actually need evaluations and recommendations. None of the information that I provide in any of the three videos should be construed as advice. Everything that I'm saying is simply for general informational or entertainment purposes only. They're simply providing you with research leads. If you need help, consult an attorney, consult some sort of Medicaid specialist who knows the law in your state. Because the situation is complicated, and like I said, up till now, we've only dealt with assets and we haven't even gotten into income. So let's dive into that now. Briefly stated, there are income limits. And in a nutshell, unlike with the assets, the idea with assets was that you have to have basically nothing. You can't have very many earthly possessions. But with income, the idea is everything that you make has to be spent towards your care. That's sort of the idea in a nutshell. Now, there are allowable what they're called deductions. One of the most important is what's called a personal needs allowance. This is a very small amount that is designed for discretionary purposes for the Medicaid recipient. In the case of a Medicaid recipient who is in control of his or her own finances, they'd be able to use their personal needs allowance on themselves. In the case of people who have Alzheimer's or some related cognitive impairment, as is the focus of this channel, most likely we're going to be talking about the custodian of that person's funds. But the personal needs allowance is extraordinarily minimal. At bottom, I think it's about $30. You find that, for example, in states like North Carolina. Some states allow it to be a little more. So, for example, in Connecticut, it's $60. All of these numbers are as of 2020. In New Hampshire, for instance, $70, I think, is allowed. Last time I checked, Florida allowed $130 for the personal needs allowance. And at the top of the pack was Alaska, which has a personal needs allowance of $200 at last check. However, this has got to be put in perspective, especially since Alaska is one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. One of the first distinctions that a person encounters in thinking about income requirements in Medicaid is the distinction between a no-income cap state 
and an income cap state. So just like with assets, we dealt with a 50% calculation state and a 100% calculation state. The income cap is the division that you're encountering first with respect to income testing. As is the case with so many things in regard to Medicaid, because the program is administered by the various states, we can expect that there's going to be vocabulary differences. So sometimes an idea is expressed in different ways depending on the state that you're in and the program that's in place in your state. So in an income cap state, we often refer to people who qualify for Medicaid as categorically needy. On the other hand, a non-income cap state might also be referred to as an income spend down state. The income spend down should not be confused with the asset spend down that we talked about in the previous video. For a refresher, I invite you to see that. The income spend down is different and in a no income cap state, some of the people who qualify for Medicaid might be referred to as medically needy instead of categorically needy. But we'll get into some of these distinctions a little more in just a minute. Let's talk about the income cap state first. But before I get into the specifics, let me make a couple of caveats. First of all, once again, this is very complex and every state has its own eligibility requirements. In some cases, a person is eligible for Medicaid based on a complex calculation that has to do with their family situation, because you remember, Medicaid can cover people of various ages in various life stations. In addition to that, Medicaid is sometimes tied to the reception of other government programs, and so that has to be kept in mind as well. And finally, even the provisional numbers that I'm going to throw at you are likely to change by year as Medicaid makes adjustments for cost of living, inflation, and other factors. But in an income cap state, the basic idea is that a person cannot qualify for Medicaid in terms of their income if their income goes above what's called the income cap. Now, this is irrespective of whether they qualify in terms of assets. So let's say a person has $2,000 of assets. If their income is too high in an income cap state, they won't qualify. Now, one number that you'll find in the literature for 2020 is an income cap of $2,349. Now this number is actually a multiple of the amount that's given by supplemental security income. And this is administered by the Social Security Administration called SSI. It is a needs-based program instead of the entitlement program that the main Social Security benefit is considered to be. So $2,349 is three times the $783 a month that SSI provides at maximum in 2020. But once again, these numbers are liable to change, so don't get too caught up with the number. Just try and get the concept. So in an income cap state, if you make $2,350, you'd be $1 over the income cap and therefore ineligible for Medicaid roughly speaking. Now this doesn't mean that a person whose income is over the amount is without hope, that there's nothing they can do. Because in an income cap state, there's actually something referred to as a Miller Trust that can help to solve the problem of a person having too much income. Now once again, this Miller Trust is an example of something that is likely to have a number of different names depending on the state that you're in. Another common label for it is a Qualified Income Trust, but it can also be referred to as an Income Cap Trust, an Irrevocable Income Trust, or even an Income Diversion Trust, and I'm sure there are other names besides. Now the name Miller actually comes from the surname of a plaintiff that brought a legal action back in the 1990s, and this took place, I believe, in Colorado. The gist of it was that some people at that time were falling into a kind of a no man's land or a catch-22 area where they made too little to pay for their nursing home expenses or other long-term care costs, but at the same time they made too much to qualify for Medicaid, and so they were in a very difficult position. We'll explain a little bit more about how the Miller Trust works in just a minute, but before I get into that, let me just give you a brief summary of what it's like in a no-income cap state. So at last count, and this is my unofficial count, 24 states were income cap state, which means that 26 states had no stated income cap. These states, as we mentioned, were also called income spend down states for the simple reason that if a person is over the $2,349 limit or whatever the eligibility limit is in that state, that person is allowed to spend their income down until they qualify and they're spending their income basically on their care. So a no income cap state essentially means that if your income is over the limit, you're allowed to spend your income down on your care until you become eligible for Medicaid, at which point Medicaid would pay the difference 
or whatever balance is left for the cost of your care. I know these ideas are complicated, so let me give you a quick example to help clarify things. Consider Jane, and let's say that Jane makes $2,550 a month. I'm picking this number because it makes some of the math a little bit easier than it might be otherwise. Now suppose a few things about Jane right off the bat. Let's suppose that Jane qualifies from the standpoint of asset requirements. So in other words, she doesn't have any more than $2,000 to her name. Let's suppose she's medically needy in all the right respects. In every other way, Jane is qualified. We're just looking at her income. Now let's start off with the assumption that she lives in a no income cap state, since those are the majority of states, just, just barely. Now let's suppose, once again, to make the math easy, that her nursing home expenses are $5,000 a month. Now that's on the low end, believe it or not. Expenses may range quite a bit more than that. They could even be double that in some circumstances. Long-term care is very expensive. But in Jane's case, in a no income cap state, essentially the procedure would be something like this. Jane would turn her income over to Medicaid. So $25.50 would go to Medicaid. Medicaid out of that would pay her her personal needs allowance. So let's suppose in her state it's $50. So out of her $25.50, $50 is an expense allowance. Now that leaves $2,500. Now even though $2,500 is more than the $2,349 that represents the income cap in income cap states, what would happen in a non-income cap state would essentially be Jane's amount, $2,500, would be applied to her care. So $5,000 of nursing home care minus her $2,500 would leave a balance of $2,500 and Medicaid would pay for the balance. In other words, Jane, presuming she's otherwise qualified for Medicaid, even though she's over the income cap, would be allowed to qualify for Medicaid on a medically needy basis in virtue of spending all of her income on her care and Medicaid would pick up the difference. Now, if she lived instead in an income cap state, things would be just a little bit different. So noticing that her income of $2,550 is over the $2,349 limit, on the face of it, Jane is simply ineligible for Medicaid. But is that the end of it? No, because if Jane, in consultation with an attorney, sets up a Miller Trust, then the situation can be salvaged and she can end up qualifying for Medicaid. And it would basically happen something like this, again, with the caveats that the actual nitty-gritty is going to vary from state to state. Basically, the idea of a Miller Trust is that excess income, income over the income limit, is paid into the trust. And after it's in the trust, it's not counted as excess income anymore. The mechanics of such trusts vary from state to state. In some states, it's just the excess income that has to be paid in. In other states, it's the entire income that has to be paid in. Generally speaking, the amount from one source has to be deposited in its entirety. So, for example, if Jane's check is $2,550, from Social Security, then the entire check would have to be deposited, and then she would be paid her expense allowance and other things from that. Now, let me say just a word about trusts in general. A trust has three important people who are associated with it. The first person is the grantor. That is the person who has property that they're putting into the trust. The second person is termed the beneficiary. That is the person for whom the trust is being set up. The third person is the trustee. The trustee is the person whose job it is to manage the granted assets on behalf of the beneficiary. Now, in some cases, like for example, a living trust, it's possible that one and the same person could play all three roles. So for instance, if you're a married couple, you set up a living trust, you guys are the grantors, you guys are the beneficiaries, and you guys are the trustees, at least so long as you're alive. But in the case of a Miller Trust, it is kind of a subset or a special case of what is often termed a special needs trust. And Medicaid requires that it be set up in particular ways. So the first thing is that it has to be irrevocable, which means that you can't take back the property that's granted. And this is very important because often living trusts and other types of run-of-the-mill trusts are revocable, meaning you can unwind them at a particular point in time, claim the property ownership back, and pretend like the trust never existed. So a Medicaid trust has to be irrevocable. In addition, the Medicaid recipient cannot be the trustee. Now, I think this holds for every state. The idea here is not so much that the person is cognitively impaired. Although that's the focus of this channel, and for most people who are watching this video, I would presuppose that the person who's the Medicaid recipient is probably incapable of managing the funds themselves. But here, this is simply a legal issue. This is a Medicaid issue. A person could be 30 years old and fully mentally competent, and yet for purposes of the Miller Trust, somebody else has to be the trustee just because Medicaid does not want one and the same person receiving Medicaid benefits and managing their Miller Trust.
Now, thirdly, the Miller Trust can be used to pay certain expenses on behalf of the Medicaid recipient. But on the Medicaid recipient's death, the state has to be made the beneficiary of the trust so that any money left in there goes back to the state. And this is part of the recovery process or the reimbursement process that we spoke a little bit about in part two. Many states allow that the Miller Trust can be used to pay for certain expenses. For example, the Medicaid recipient's personal needs allowance might be payable from the trust. Secondly, if the Medicaid recipient has a spouse who, because of the redirection of the Medicaid recipient's income, no longer has enough to live on, there is also what is called a Minimum Monthly Maintenance Needs Allowance, or MMMNA, a mouthful there, that is also payable to the spouse, the community spouse, the person who is not institutionalized. So, for example, if the Medicaid recipient was the primary breadwinner, their being in a home and having all of their income directed toward their care might put their spouse, the person who's not in an institution, that person might now not have enough to live on. And if that's the case, Medicaid provides that this minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance can be used for the community spouse to pay living expenses. And in some cases, that can also be paid out of the Miller Trust. Additionally, money that is not necessary to pay the needs allowance, either for the Medicaid recipient or the spouse, is often used to pay a share of the cost of the Medicaid recipient's care. So for example, the Miller Trust could be set up to pay a portion of money for the care of the Medicaid recipient in the nursing home or other long-term care institution. Sometimes there are additional purposes. These are very limited, but an example of this might be the payment of Medicare premiums. So for instance, Medicare being health insurance for seniors, many seniors will have Medicare, and Medicare is relevant to the person's overall health picture, even though Medicare is not in the first place relevant to paying long-term care costs. Doctor visits, hospital visits are going to be paid by Medicare in the way that they would normally be, and so Medicare premiums have to be paid and the Miller Trust can be set up to pay the Medicare premiums as well. In some states, again, consult your attorney for more information about your situation in your state. When the Medicaid recipient dies, the state will claim the money that's left in the Miller Trust, and there's probably not going to be very much, but the state will get access to that. Now, finally, there are limits in some states as to how much can be paid into a Miller Trust. This is going to vary, so once again, if you have questions about it, consult your attorney. The practical limitation is going to be the cost of care. Let me just say a few words in summation and reflection on the different ways of paying for long-term care costs. So I've stated this in other videos, but essentially there are only three ways to pay for long-term care. At least this is the way I'm conceiving of it. The first way is proceeds from some kind of an insurance policy. So this could be a dedicated long-term care policy, whether it's qualified policy, non-qualified policy. It could be a short-term care policy. It might be a life insurance policy that's got a long-term care benefit attached to it. Sometimes those are referred to as hybrid policies. So that's one way to pay, insurance proceeds. A second way would be privately paying paying out of your own income or own assets. And for some people, this is an option. The third option is essentially the government benefits. And that's what we have been concentrating so heavily on in these past videos. Medicaid is the only game in town if you don't have insurance and you don't have private assets. For some people, these choices are going to be fairly obvious. So for instance, if your portfolio for you or you and your spouse together is a million dollars, two million dollars or more, most likely you're going to be looking at private paying that is, unless you've got some sort of an insurance policy factored into your plan. On the other hand, if a person has so few assets, let's say $100,000 or less, it may be that Medicaid is the only game in town because there's no realistic way that they could pay for Medicare out of the meager assets or the very little income that they have. The real question, the question mark, is going to be for those people whose portfolio is a little bit more robust than the person who's obviously a candidate for Medicaid, but at the same time their portfolio is not as expansive as the person who's got access to millions of dollars. And this is where the decision process is really going to be very difficult because you're going to have a number of trade-offs that you're going to have to weigh between preserving assets, possibly thinking about legacy, if there's a married couple. Obviously, if, a, if only one person needs care, the other person still presumably is going to have to have access to that money in order to retire, to propel them from retirement all the way to death. So it can be a very difficult situation. I invite you to sit down with experts in your area who are able to sift through the various financial facts of your circumstance and who know the laws of your state so that they can best advise you. This video hopefully has been of some assistance to you. I once again want to reiterate that Medicaid is very complex. You can get into a lot of trouble 
if you don't do things correctly. We talked about violations of the asset transfer protocols in the last video, and so you definitely don't want to run afoul of any of those things. I know this is complicated. I speak from experience because my dad actually had to go through the Medicaid spend down process with my mom as well. It's not an envious place to be in, and I get that. I hope this video was of some use to you in that case. If you found the video of use, I do ask that you like the video. It helps me not only to know what content is being appreciated, but it also helps from the standpoint of the YouTube metrics. If you know somebody who might be interested in this content, please share it with them. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I do wish you the best, and I hope to see you again in another video. Thank you so much.